Hello everybody, I'm Matthew Walsh and I want to welcome you to MD Insights today. I'm with uh, Dr. Kareem Abu El Majad, who goes by sort of like Madonna, just Kareem. One, he's, he's a one name guy. Um, Kareem, it's great to have you on. You're so well known, um, I don't need to probably get a lot of your past other than I think everyone should should know that uh, originally from Egypt and ha you have a strong commitment to that country still to this day. But you worked, uh, you know, you got your academic start and cred with Dr. Tom Starzl in Pittsburgh. I'm just wondering if you could give us a, a, a story of Dr. Starzl that just to kick us off here that you remember fondly even to this day. Well, thank you, Matt, um, uh, for your leadership and as well as your friendship. As you know, as you alluded that my uh, journey uh, for uh, in the medical field uh, started when I was six years old, when I lost my dad. And uh, at the time, uh, whatever God creates in me that um, I uh, just don't believe in what the hypocrite said, uh, that where is the art of medicine is love, there is also love of humanity. And that stayed with me until today and for the rest of my life. Uh, I started the journey from the Delta area in, in Egypt, and I came to the United States uh, with one goal, is to participate in the advance of medicine and the surgical field came to uh, Wayne State University in 83, moved to uh, Emory University in 84, and uh, to Pittsburgh in 1989. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with uh, the surgeons of the century, the American surgeons of the surgery, Dean Warren, at Emory and Dr. Stars of the father who got trans of, uh, got of uh, liver and uh, transplantation and transplantation in general in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, sad, having said that, uh, that as you uh, said, um, uh, my journey with transplantation started there at uh, University of Pittsburgh with uh, Dr. Stars uh, we uh, worked together for more than two decades, and uh, I was at the right place at the right time. And uh, he definitely uh, saw in me what I never saw, that there is something that uh, I could offer to the field of organ transplantation. At the time, we uh, developed the program for FK 546 at the time, that was an evolution in immunosuppression of, of transplantation. And in 1990, after he uh, tried uh, uh, intestinal multivisceral transplantation a few years earlier, assigned me to take the lead with the rest of the team in the development of the small bowel and multivisceral transplantation. Uh, and uh, then, uh, uh, in the, as you may know, in uh, 2012, uh, I was uh, seduced by the Cleveland Clinic and uh, came to join um, the giant uh, institution that is one of the top hospitals in the country. And at the time, uh, I was able to continue um, um, the, my uh, uh, innovative uh, ideas and uh, adding to uh, the advancement of the field of gut failure and gut rehabilitation and we together work together uh, and we developed the, the uh, one of the pioneer uh, centers in the uh, gut rehabilitation and transplantation uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Yes, and it's been a fantastic journey for you, partly because you uh, love innovation and to take, tackle difficult problems. So not only did you start in transplantation, 
now got rehab and including an interesting topic I wanted to talk about you with you today, which is about uh, surgery for intestinal malrotation. So I, I thought I would just, you know, some people may think of it as um, a pediatric disease. Is it really only a pediatric disease or does it involve adults as well? Give us some background, both of the anatomy and when does it present? So uh, when I, I moved to the Cleveland Clinic uh, for um, uh, two main reasons that uh, uh, I shared uh, uh, with all of you here is a patient comes first and innovation is the only way you can change uh, the life of another human being. And with my love uh, to the patients and innovation, um, I accepted uh, uh, myself as a member of the Cleveland Clinic, of the family of the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, the minute, as you may remember, I came, I drove everybody crazy, uh, getting everybody sick from all over the world to come here because I believe in the Cleveland Clinic mission in delivering the best care to these patients. And with what God gave me in the operating room, that both together with a beautiful marriage that was the, behind the production of a, a new procedure, uh, that it's not the only one we offer here at the Cleveland Clinic, but we develop the whole field uh, of gut transplantation and 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 uh, and gut rehabilitation together in an integrative and an innovative approach. So, with the experience over the last uh, eight years, nine years here, we were able to introduce a, a new procedure that help the patients who are suffering from uh, gut malrotation. Uh, gut malrotation, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, is one of the ignored uh, field in, 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 uh, in, in the medical and surgical uh, science. Uh, the story with the malrotation started with the professor Ladd at the uh, uh, Boston Children's Hospital at Harvard. In 1932, which he introduced um, his procedure called the LAD procedure for the kids who were born with in bowel obstruction and uh, at the duodenum because of the malrotation and development of ad adhesion in this area. And the operation was primarily developed by Professor Ladd to relieve the bowel obstruction in these babies and save their life, particularly those who develop twists or valvulus of their intestine. Since then, there is actually no uh, uh, advancement in the treatment of this field. And there was the notion that because he was a pediatric surgeon, and uh, most of these uh, kids were treated with pediatric uh, uh, patients or children or newborn babies. The notion of the misunderstanding that if, though it's a congenital disease, if you're born with it, it stay with you for the rest of your life, it was uh, uh, misunderstood by the medical community. It's only the disease of the children as you noted early on. And when I start working on the, or with the development of the intestinal and the multivisceral transplant, I start realizing that a good percentage of our patients that lost to the, or the pediatric patients in particular, lost to the intestine because of the mid gut valvulus with my rotation. So it came to my mind, how can we, nothing is better than your own gut. How can I develop a procedure based on what I learned from the surgical techniques of retrieving the organs from the donor and give it to the recipient? How can I develop a procedure that will protect these kids from 
losing the gut and uh, change their life forever, even if we give them a small bowel and multivisceral transplant. So with what I learned from the donor and recipient operation, I start applying uh, this on those patients who have malrotation with clinical symptoms to start with, to protect them from developing malrotation. And um, so far, we have about 90 patients that were able to do the new operation for them to protect them from losing the gut, children and adults, and also they develop chronic symptoms that when they are 50, 60 years of old, uh, 60 or even 65 years old patients, they lost their intestine from uh, malrotation and valvulus. So what I'm tr we're trying to tell the co medical community that malrotation stays with the patient for the rest of their life. The lab procedure does not protect them from losing the gut at any stage in their life. They develop chronic symptoms because the malrotation, it is not just the, uh, the, the, the abnormal position of the intestine, it's a disease of the organ called mesentery that was ignored uh, over, oh, oh, over the last century or so that nobody pay attention to it. And with this uh, new operation, uh, we, uh, we are uh, very pleased uh, to let our patients or uh, the medical community that the data would be presented at one of the highest and prestigious surgical society in the world called the American Surgical Association and showing the outcome with the kids and adults who require transplant because of the mid-gut valvulus and the catastrophic loss of the intestine. As well as those, we were able to rescue them from the fa failure of the lab procedure and also the patients who develop symptoms versus those who develop symptoms from the malrotation and we're trying to add to the medical field a, a, a new paradigm for the uh, management and diagnosis of patients with uh, 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 gut malrotation or the right term is gut rotation anomalies. We're going to call it GRA. Yeah, so essentially it's a disorder of, rot of rotation of the mesentery. So help us out, um, since you noted that the, these patients may have chronic symptoms, what, give us a flavor as to what those symptoms are and when should a, a physician be thinking that this is the cause of their uh, complaints? So as Professor Ladd said uh, in his, his first paper in, in 1932, at the time, although the, uh, the discovery with a, uh, of the malrotation as a cause of uh, bowel obstruction in the kids, he said it's easily forgotten diagnosis. And if the physician don't pay attention or do not keep in mind about the possible uh, malrotation that can cause the symptom that the patient has, not only the kids, but also the adults. Uh, you can see in the literature that hundreds of case reports about different presentation for the malrotation. The patient who were referred to us, there is a, actually the patient were the advocate of themselves and they develop the website or the as the um, uh, society, what they call it, uh, the uh, 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 my rotation awareness website was developed by the patient, adult patients who have got my rotation or intestinal my rotation and the physicians that ignored their symptoms and sometimes they label them as they have psychiatric disorders. These symptoms goes from first, most important thing, intermittent abdominal pain, the most common one, uh, uh, foot intolerance, nausea, vomiting, constipation, 
uh, alternating with diarrhea. Sometimes they have also pelvic floor dysfunction. And all the symptoms, it is, it is, you can definitely, if you're not aware of the bowel rotation, and then you pay attention to the investigation you're going doing for these patients to make the diagnosis of my rotation or the radiologists don't pay attention trying to find it, then they miss a diagnosis and they label the patient that they have psychiatric or functional disorders. Uh, once you make the diagnosis, then you know that the, uh, the, uh, the, the my rotation could be a contributing factor uh, to the process. Not just the abnormal position of the, uh, of the intestine, including the proximal part of the intestine, the duodenum, and the colon, but also a good person, more than half of this patient have a, the neuroenteric system of the gut doesn't function well because, as you may know, uh, Matt, that when the embryo develops, there is migration of the mesoderm or the cell that make the, the intestine, both the mucosa with the endoderm and the mesoderm with the muscle and nervous tissue. So for some reason that we will definitely elaborate on it in the, in the paper, that these patients have not just a mechanical problem, they also have a functional problem and they develop this motility of the large bowel as well as sometimes occasionally the stomach. And part of the surgical innovative technique we developed is to tackle both problems. And they fix the intestine in a way that the intestine would not rotate and cause valvulus and, and, uh, and patient will be saved from any catastrophic event that we seeing could happen at the age of 60, 65, or even older. So what, what uh, diagnostic tests do you feel are important to make a correct diagnosis? So the way I look at it, it's, uh, it's interestingly that most of these patients, they come to us, they already have the diagnosis made um, uh, by sometimes increase awareness of the physician who's taking care of them. And sometimes they do incidental CAT scan or a GI study with the gastrographin or the barium. And they found that the intestine is in an abnormal location. So most of the, although they have the symptoms and the screening of the gut that make the diagnosis, uh, the most important uh, uh, studies to make the diagnosis of my rotation is radiologic imaging. The radiologic imaging would, uh, uh, is too important. In the old days, usually the GI follow through with the standard, the gold standard uh, diagnostic test. Now we have the, uh, the uh, uh, CAT scans or MRIs, and actually they are, give us more and better information to define it's the malrotation uh, or the GRA or gut rotation anomalies in the spectrum mat. So it's not only when the intestine could arrest at certain stage, and based on the stage of arrest, and that did not complete the 270 degree rotation, that we all uh, have when we were in, in the womb or in the embryo, uh, they could, the intestine could rotate only 90 degrees, sometimes 180 degrees, uh, sometimes the upper part to rotate 90, the lower part to rotate 180. So it's a dynamic process for the intestine to be in a different position that, than, the, than the normal anatomic position and the intestine and the mesentery is not fixed. So we we'll combine both together um, that use it, we use it as the diagnostic criteria when we review the imaging studies of these patients. A very pathognomonic or standard uh, 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 finding that we need to look for with the intestine not rotating normally and uh, the uh, blood vessels of the intestine are reversed. The artery is to the, uh, to the, um, 
uh, to the uh, right of the vein and the vein to the left of the artery. Uh, with the new procedure, without interrupting the blood vessels, we were able to reverse the process uh, or reverse the position and, uh, and put the vein to the right side and the artery to the left side of the vein. And that is what the normal anatomy that, uh, that we all have. So the most important testing to make the diagnosis of rotation is the imaging studies. Um, and then in addition to that, we need to look for the second component of my rotation, which is the functional disorder if the myoenteric system of the gut, mainly the intestine and the colon, and the colon more affected than the intestine. Uh, that will include uh, some uh, emptying studies, uh, SITS markers, um, uh, anal, anal manometric studies, and we also found in this patient, they have at a high, higher risk of visceral pain. Uh, the, for some reason, the enteric nervous system is very hypersensitive and, uh, and they sometimes give them a visceral pain uh, that during uh, defecation or going to the bathroom, et cetera, et cetera. So I sort of consider myself a normal person. If, if I were to get a CT scan today and found to have malrotation, would I need to get it repaired just because of the anatomic abnormality or should I have symptoms? Excellent question, Matt. That's why I have the control group and the study actually including the largest number of uh, patient with my rotation, uh, um, uh, 500 patients. Uh, some of these uh, that uh, did not require surgery asymptomatic. Some uh, were symptomatic and were not treated uh, based on our radiologic uh, files. And then those who came to me from across the world, from every country, from every continent, and we were able, the Cleveland Clinic was generous enough, we were able to accommodate them and help with those patients, including those that um, I was able to help in Egypt through my uh, charity foundation. Uh, when you allow me to go for a week or two uh, there, two or three times a year uh, before the COVID. And, um, and then we have the transplanted patients, which I included them in the study to show how catastrophic uh, the uh, volvulus that could happen to the patient, pediatric and the adults. And be because of the lack of awareness in the emergency room by the radiologist, by the physician, by the surgeons, by the time this patient taken to the operating room, they already have a dead bowel and their life changes forever. Keep in mind the patient we transplanted, those who survived the catastrophic event, I can tell you how many kids all over the world, the parents call me when the child is about to die. Even here in the United States, the parents call me and they said, we heard about you, we have, I have my newborn baby, the surgeon explored them and they lifted the dead, the bowel dead in them. They said there is no hope they could survive. And that is exactly, there is a, a paper just published recently in the pediatric surgery that the consensus in the pediatric society that most of the physician based on an interview with them that most of the surgeons, when they explore newborn baby with dead bowel, they close them up and they encourage the family to go for comfort care. That has to change. And that is what the reason the American Surgical Association accepted our work to be presented in April, because this has to change. This babies could be saved and they could have a normal life. Uh, the data showing in the transplant patient, uh, transplanted in 1990, they are now married, they have kids, they finished college, they working, so they could be a functioning, productive uh, a member of the society. To answer your question now, what would you do with asymptomatic patients? 
based on what I said, if my son or my brother or my friend Matt have my rotation, I will tie his hands and go and fix it because I do not want him at the age of 65 had acute catastrophic event and by the time we take him to the operating room that the intestine will be gone. So we really have, instead of facing the problem with a catastrophic problem, we have to work on it and prevent it before it happens. So I would suggest, although maybe the medical community, as you may know, changing the, uh, changing, uh, the field of medicine usually takes courage and also resistance resistance from the medical community to change what they study in the medical school, what they read in the book. But hopefully with the data I'm going to share with this association and with the medical community at large, that will convince the pediatric surgeons and physicians to be aware of my rotation as a cause of chronic abdominal symptoms, at least and the pediatric surgeons to learn the new procedure and to understand that the lab procedure was done for only acute abdominal problem to temporarily solve the bowel blockage and the volvulus, not the permanent treatment for rotation or for the uh, rotation anomalies. Because what the lab procedure did only reversed the rotation to an earlier phase, did not correct the rotation anomalies. So tell us briefly, what, what is the, how do you surgically correct the malrotation? Well, it's, uh, uh, we're actually developing as, um, uh, with your permission, I'm working now in developing an, an animation and the video uh, tape uh, uh, as soon as we publish the data, we're going to be in the website, the Cleveland Clinic website, uh, because we want uh, the product uh, to save lives and uh, a, a, the, in brief, I play with the whole gut to put it in the, in the position that you see it in the anatomy book move the duodenum to the left side under the uh, severe mesenteric artery and vein, uh, uh, fix all the organs in place, move the colon to the right side, and fix the mesentery in the posterior proteinium. Uh, so uh, at the end, as we did the case yesterday, one of our surgical residents, second year, was said, how come nobody did this? 30 years or 40 years ago, I said, here what you are here for to learn this and you can um, uh, carry the, the, the mission. And I hope everybody uh, will learn. It's a simple procedure. Uh, the complications close to none complications. Uh, none of the patients, about 90 patients uh, received the operation. Excuse me, none of them uh, developed any complications um, at large. And, um, and that is it's just a very simple procedure that, be honest with you, Matt, I would never be able to do it or vision it if I did not do all the donor operations and manipulate the intestine and, and uh, you, know, you, you, you know, you deal when you do this for, did about six, seven, eight hundred patients uh, transplant over 30 years then you feel like, you know, when you deal with the intestine, uh, it's like a toy. And, you know, enjoy uh, uh, doing that. And I just want to um, uh, let everybody know, and this is for the uh, physician and the patients. Uh, the unique thing about the Cleveland Clinic, and particularly the uh, Center for Gut Rehabilitation and Transplantation, it's a very comprehensive program. We, if you're a patient, we will take, you, take care of you from A to Z. We only do 
only do what you need uh, and we do the best thing for you so so you can uh, go home enjoy your life enjoy your family uh, and that is what created what I have inside me when I lost my father when I was six year old and then I graduated from the medical school. The year I graduated from the medical school, I lost my sister who's 27 year old. It gave me a poster dose to love humanity. And you may all know that my phone number is with, since my cell phone is with every patient I operated upon, every single patient. I operated the bond, and that with the help of, of Dr. Walsh and the Cleveland Clinic, I want to continue my mission on a charity level uh, through my foundation in Egypt. And uh, for the physicians, if you have any problem with the patient, complex abdominal pathology, patient lost the intestine, a one day old baby, 85 year old. A man, please let us know. We can help you. We can help him, and and we can put them back to life. And what we have here is unique, and that's why I moved to the Cleveland Clinic because I know they have the material. I know they believe in in patient care. It's a very comprehensive uh, an institution at all levels and uh, the, we get the support we need and we give the patient the best care they could ever receive anywhere in the world. So Kareem, congratulations. I can't uh, overestimate to our audience the prestige of having your work accepted at the American Surgical Association. Congratulations on that. I think we all can see your obvious passion and I could not reinforce more how much of a humanitarian you are uh, through your foundation. So we're very proud of you. And we're so thrilled that you were on MD Insights with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Walsh. I should say Matt. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.